I'm going to be talking about today is a chapter that um, I wrote with a colleague, Isabel Tavora, for the um, uh, social policy report on the EU in 2021. Um, we did the work uh, really bet um, in 2020 between March and June, July. Uh, and so obviously to some extent it's a bit out of date. And I'm currently involved in a little bit more work on what's happening under COVID and gender, in particular in relation to the value of frontline workers um, for the International Labour Organization. But that's in a different state. It's not quite complete yet. And so I will make a few comments as, as I go along. But um, as I said, um, obviously, some of the questions might be how far is this uh, affecting current situation one year on? And obviously, when we started, we didn't expect to be in a similar situation one year on. So um, apologies for if you find it a bit out of date, but I just thought I would explain that context. Um, because it was for the EU social policy report, we were also interested, and I'll come back to at the end, uh, of the implications for the EU's gender equality strategy and what we might need to do for promoting gender equality in the future. And that could be a, a, um, a general uh, area of, of debate as well as um, specifically around the COVID issue. Okay, so the first thing, the first question we started with was the impact on employment. Um, and some of you may know, I've done quite a lot of work on women in crises. I had a, wrote a book on women and recession in the 1980s and another book on women and austerity in 2013. Um, but to some extent, the, um, the situation was more complex in the COVID crisis because the ways in which um, people were affected, affected both men and women and both male dominated and female dominated sectors. So I'll try and make some sense of that, but I don't think there's not a straightforward story about who um, was most affected. Um, women were certainly concentrating what we call three poles. Um, on the one hand, they were in sectors where the workplaces were closed and it was not possible to be able to do work from home. And I give some examples here, personal service workers, accommodation and food service workers, some cleaners, not all cleaners because some buildings were open. Um, and then a second group of closed workplaces, but you could actually continue working from home and that is mainly administrative and professional jobs. And then a third poll where you had open workplaces and key workers and women were very important in some of those areas, uh, a lot of those areas, health and social care workers in particular and food sales staff. And then there's some a little bit in between, depending on the country. Um, teachers were sometimes cl in clo had closed workplaces. In other places, schools remained open, uh, either altogether or for key workers. Uh, Non-food retail kept opening and closing, etc. And I would say that men's jobs were also polarized. Um, um, but uh, and that was particularly true at the beginning of the first wave, where areas such as manufacturing and construction in many countries are also closed down. But what's interesting is male dominated sectors tended to come back on stream a bit earlier, whereas women have dominated what I would call the long term closed sectors, such as accommodation and food services, uh, and increasingly, um, the uh, obviously affected by declines in the retail sector as people have gone online rather than into, into um, physical retail. So it's a complicated story, not straightforward. Um, what we do know is that more men were able to work from home because most of those, those jobs came from administrative and professional jobs, but also quite a sizable share of female workers in professional and clerical jobs were also able to work from home. So a mixed picture. Sorry, um, it's not, my slide isn't moving for some reason. Why is that? <laughs> oh, it has, it, no, it hasn't moved. Ah, oh, there we are, sorry. <laughs> um, so that was the first starting point and that's looking at the impact on employment. And then we also uh, started to look at the whole issue of whether or not um, COVID-19 led to certain types of employment uh, 
uh, being recognized as being undervalued and also of more importance than perhaps we had recognized in, in um, uh, generally. Um, and here this, the, the table in front of you relates to the treatment of key workers in health and social care in this first phase of the pandemic. Um, and in many countries, I don't know whether it includes Poland or, or not, uh, but certainly in the UK, there were what do we call claps for carers, where on Thursday nights, everyone went out and clapped the um, nurses and the care workers and other people who are essential in seeing us through the pandemic. Um, and in many places, there was apparent public pressure and often trade union pressure to do something about um, the, um, uh, the low wages and poor working conditions, particularly in areas such as social care, but also in many countries for nurses. Um, but it, what we found in this early phase is that there wasn't that much being done. There were the bonuses and you've got some um, sort of, but they were mainly short term. And in fact, um, my subsequent research has suggested that a lot of these were withdrawn very quickly because everyone assumed there'd be a one-off crisis and then they could withdraw them. And many countries that offered bonuses in the first wave have not necessarily renewed them. So I mentioned a few in this slide of countries that have, did offer bonuses, but there was much more limited attention to doing anything longer term about raising pay in areas such as nursing. Now, one example um, where there was a pay rise, so it's more like 15% like in France, um, that was a commitment by the government and then there were long negotiations with unions and that did re result in a significant pay rise. Um, I, I, should, I mentioned earlier on that I have actually been more recently looking at some of these issues again. And we decided not to look at France because it, I was advised that it's become very complicated because it's not clear who those pay rises are for, whether they're for the whole of the health and social care sector or mainly for the public sector. Uh, and as there were ongoing disputes and, and protests, um, it, 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 I was advised it might be a complicated question. So even there, it wasn't straightforward. And in Hungary, the other case we found where a, a pay rise was was um, promised of significant amounts of 20% on November 2020 came with many strings attached, um, including uh, I think not necessarily being able to resign or migrate, or at least a similar pay rise for doctors had those kind of um, conditions attached. So it wasn't just a, a revaluing. In some places, there was also offers of more secure contracts, Greece, provided permanent contracts for people on social care. Um, but there was also problems that people um, in areas of the health and social care that was not involved in COVID, they may lose um, earnings because they, these areas were shut down and they lost overtime in Croatia. And in Finland, there was a promised improvement in pay for nurses that was postponed. And in Ireland, there was a controversy over new hires on precarious contracts. Um, I would say that our current research shows, again, a lot of support for doing something, but little actual action. And I've already mentioned the source, the problem about bonuses being very short term. Um, where there's collective bargaining agreements, there was some increase in pay, but usually beyond the cases I've cited and also including Germ Germany also in the end provided quite a significant pay rise. Uh, many of the nurses paid settlements under COVID have been affected by austerity with offers such in Australia of 0.3% and in the UK of 1%, hardly major um, uh, recognition of um, what's happened to nurses during this period. And indeed of often the stagnation of nurses pay after the financial crisis. So there's a backlog of undervaluation um, even if there was any point at which nurses have been properly valued, certainly in the period post the financial crisis, in many Western European countries, at least the situation for nurses has deteriorated. I recognize that in some Eastern European countries, there has been an, up, um, an improvement in public sector pay and in minimum wage levels, 
Um, I'm not an expert on that, and I'd be interested to hear your views on how that's been happening. And we've certainly been looking a little bit at Slovakia, where nurses' pay has gone up, um, uh, but not necessarily through collective bargaining in the work I'm doing for the um, ILO. Um, beyond pay, um, there was some successes in improving sick pay for people in social care and, nurse, and nursing, although nurses usually had better sick pay um, than social care workers. Um, but one of the problems of the clapping for carers, particularly social care workers, is of course that so many people died in um, residential care uh, that in some cases people are now losing their jobs because uh, many of the um, residents have died and there is not a great enthusiasm amongst the general public to, to enter or to put their, their elderly loved ones into care homes while COVID is still present and the risk of infections in care homes continues. So the prospects for care workers are not looking that great. So, um, so that was our first um, consideration was what was actually happening to women's employment. And then we went on to look at what was the differences in support for income and employment under COVID-19 uh, for those who were um, um, going to uh, uh, forced not to work or to work shorter hours or who lost their jobs. And um, here we wanted to look at the main risks for women and how far they've been accommodated by um, the policies of um, different governments. Um, and that we, we identified three main risks that women have more limited access to income and employment protection. Um, firstly, they might be in jobs in sectors that are not covered by um, job retention schemes, short time work schemes or exceptional unemployment schemes. A second risk was they might fail to meet eligibility conditions, even if their sector was covered. And the third risk is they might be paid lower benefits. Um, I think what I would want to stress though, before I get into these sort of negatives and how women haven't necessarily fared fully as well as men, um, I think that we have to recognize that this was a period of very positive innovations. Um, and the rapid way in which different countries developed short job retention schemes, income support schemes, short time work schemes, and parental leave schemes, which I'll come on to in more detail later, it, it was really quite impressive and certainly suggests that we don't need to take three years debating you know, a, sm a small change or improvement to our social protection systems. If needs must, um, civil servants and governments can innovate quite quickly and find ways around um, and to extend protection to groups who have previously not been protected, such as the self-employed, even though not all countries did that. So let me think about then the, the positive innovation uh, that we identified um, um, on the part of um, social protection schemes. I should sort of stress that um, under the financial crisis, um, short-term work schemes and job retention schemes were also important, but they were mainly applied in manufacturing and many, many women were excluded. And if I just quote for um, the situation in Germany, only one in four women um, were beneficiaries of the scheme compared to men. Um, whereas my understanding from the first phase, at least of the um, COVID, I haven't updated that since, uh, more women and more female dominated sectors were benefiting from short time work schemes in Germany. So quite a reversal. And we can see that there was some uh, positive innovation in the sense, uh, for example, more inclusive of services, uh, not just manufacturing in many countries. And for example, in Italy, many more small firms were included uh, than in the financial crisis. Most countries provided, um, uh, made uh, self-employed eligible for some forms of support, which given that not all self-employed have access to unemployment benefit, th this was really very important. Some, it varied um, how generous those schemes were, more, more varied across countries, I would say, than the job retention short time work schemes that tended to pay something between 60 to 80% of earnings um, from, in most countries. 
whereas um, self-employed support was often a flat rate or linked to uh, complicated formulae that uh, might exclude various people. That certainly happened in the UK. And then there were various other innovations, such as in Finland, they halved the weeks of contributions needed to be able to claim unemployment benefit. Uh, and in the UK, there was explicit um, uh, agreement that employers could include zero hours workers and they could be included on the basis of their average earnings over the previous, I can't remember now, that six or 12 weeks. So if they were zero hours workers, but had actually been working long hours, they could in principle have received quite a lot of support. But the problem in the UK and in some other countries, this was all at the discretion of the employer. So although it was allowed, it wasn't necessarily activated. And we don't know yet how far it was activated. There was also um, innovation in benefit levels. Um, there was a higher percentage compensation, compensation for the low paid in seven countries. And I think in five countries, I, I think that need, figure might need revising, but certainly applied in Portugal and some other countries where um, the amount you received couldn't go below the minimum wage. Um, then there was also gender gaps, however, in the coverage. Um, uh, domestic workers were, was an issue. In Bulgaria, um, they were excluded. They were also initially excluded in Italy, um, but there was campaigns to include them and they were brought in at a lower payment level. And I think the same applied also in Spain. Um, there were also problems that informal workers and many of the informal workers are women uh, and freelance workers uh, who are, if you like, self-employed, but not maybe um, um, having full accounts, etc., might not be covered. Some particular categories of workers that included many women, for example, those holding mini jobs in Germany, that is very short hours jobs were excluded. And Hungary, although it doesn't have many part-time workers, explicitly excluded them. Um, and where um, access, in some countries like such as my own, there was no specific parental leave scheme, but the government allowed employers to put somebody on furlough because they needed to be at home to care for children because of closed schools and nurseries. But a, a recent poll conduct, conducted by the Trade Union Congress found that seven out of the 10 mothers who responded uh, to their poll had applied for that furlough scheme and been refused by their employers, even though the furlough scheme was of no cost to the employer. Um, and another problem is that the benefit level, um, and I'll come on to this a bit more detail, is, was often lower, particularly if you were taking leave for parental care reasons rather than job retention schemes. So um, one of the things that we focused on quite a lot in our uh, report was um, the challenges of reconciling care and paid work under lockdown and the role of government policies there. Um, so the threats to gender equality were due also to increased care work for families due to school and nursery closes, closures. Um, and there were expectations that women were more, um, that women would be more affected were certainly confirmed in the earlier studies with women taking the lion's share, even then though men also increased their involvement in care. If they, and that was particularly true according to Eurostat figures and the like, um, uh, if they were working from home. If they were working outside the home, uh, this improvement disappeared. Now, because I'm conscious that um, this was a, a, um, a, an early glimpse at what had happened, I was looking uh, today for some more up-to-date data from Eurostat on what's happened to the sharing of work and care uh, in the home um, under the second wave. Unfortunately, as far as I can gather, their, their most recent survey doesn't directly repeat their very interesting data on how many hours of work and, and unpaid care work men and women were doing. But what it did do was highlight to me a very interesting figure here um, which is showing the long-term toll on women from childcare under COVID. Uh, 
And this table gives the proportion of parents declaring that they're too tired after work to do household jobs. And I don't take it from this that because they're too tired that somebody else does them. Uh, <laughs> that might be an interpretation, but we'd need more evidence of that. And what you can see here, is, uh, if you look at the bottom, is that women, the share of women in spring 2021 who were too tired to do after work to do household jobs had risen significantly in, in all the categories, um, apart from working only from home and having no children under 12. Uh, and 44% of women who worked in other, other employers' premises were particularly tired. Um, and 39% of women who worked only from home were also had 13, uh, very tired. That is when they had children under 12. And you compare that, um, it, the, the figures uh, for men with children under 12 are, are under half for those working in employers' premises and 15% um, lower uh, for those who worked only from home. So I think we can see that the ongoing waves of the crisis has meant that any initial enthusiasm perhaps for men to fully to share in this work may have diminished. Um, and they may not be in, in some sense allowed to help. And of course, we've had all the problems of schools being closed again and homeschooling. Um, so returning now though to the period um, uh, of the first wave, um, we looked at the availability of parental leave um, for um, people who had responsibility for children when schools were closed um, uh, or nurseries closed. Um, 20 of the 28 countries, we were including the UK here for the, at that time period, we haven't quite fully left the EU. Um, and um, in most cases, it was provided as a right but in four cases, you can see the uh, on the slide, Australia, Belgium, so I, I, I've got a thing in front of the <laughs> bit of my slide, I can't see, and the UK, um, they had to get employer consent. And I've given you that evidence that that was problematic in the UK. It may be less problematic in countries where short time working and things was more um, established and were more wider um, representation of trade unions. Um, the level of pay was also problematic. In 10 cases, pay was the same or higher than the job protection schemes, but it was lower in the remaining cases. And in fact, was very low uh, in Bulgaria and unpaid in Spain. Two countries, Belgium and Cyprus, however, did provide increased pay for, par for parental leave if you were a single parent. Um, um, some countries you can see only gave it to uh, parental leave to employees, uh, but most countries did extend it to self-employed. And Germany, for example, gave it to the those in mini jobs. Um, there were some innovative areas of design, um, although uh, experts don't necessarily think it had that much effect, but at least it was the incentives were designed for sharing in Belgium and Italy in different ways. In Belgium, you could only take 50% time leave but both partners could take 50% time leave. So in principle, you could have 100% leave covering your children over the whole week. And in Italy, you had to, if you wanted continuous leave, you had to rotate with your partner. Again, I'm waiting on real data on whether this was taken up much, but at least it's a, an indication of what could be done. Um, and some countries, um, we don't have full information on that, only allow people to take leave, a parental leave, if they could not work from home, which assumes that you could combine work with childcare, which is a big stretch, particularly if we're talking about nursery closures and young uh, primary school children. So we came up with some recommendations that to ensure gender equality, COVID leave should be a right of working parents not dependent on employer consent. It should provide decent independent income um, and support parents of very young children, even if their jobs can be done from home and obviously include incentives for fathers to share. So moving on to our, conc our conclusions from this study, um, we did see a, a major potential risk 
of, um, sorry, I'm, I'm just, just before I go into the risk, let me say that um, our conclusion that it was extremely important to integrate gender mainstreaming into all these policy interventions. Uh, and to the extent this happened, it was more random and ad hoc rather than by design. Uh, and uh, if, if there had been more time to um, consider the innovations before they were brought in, it's possible that more um, NGOs and interested groups of women or, would have actually made suggestions and that might have improved matters. But it's interesting that it wasn't necessarily considered in most countries. Um, I think the gender mainstreaming uh, is, remains an important part of the EU's gender equality policy. And I think the COVID pandemic shows how um, matters that are not directly or designed to do anything to do with gender equality can have a massive potential impact. And that is why gender mainstreaming must be maintained alongside gender specific policies if we want to make progress um, towards gender equality. Um, the risk of reversal of progress uh, towards gender equality uh, is very strong because women are more vulnerable to job and income loss, partly as a function of the kinds of jobs they do, the sectors they do, and also this increased involvement in care. Um, but there were also potential opportunities. Men had become more involved in care uh, during the first wave. And there was, a, and in particular, there's been a spread and normalizing of, of teleworking and flexible working. Um, and many com companies in the past that have treated uh, the right to even telework uh, occasionally when children are sick or uh, one or two days a week, or even just to reduce commuting time, who treat it as a major problem uh, and likely to lead to major loss of productivity have all been proved dramatically wrong. And I think that will be a, a lasting legacy. Of course, the, what companies do with that um, legacy is another matter because uh, there could be many major negative effects of this normalization of teleworking. It could lead to new segregation between women uh, working at home and men working in the office. And it could lead to more fragmentation, more use of platforms and all kinds of other things. But nevertheless, it's shown that employers often suggest there are more barriers than there really are towards um, more flexible um, and more innovative forms of working. This is a little bit like the government saying there are more barriers to innovating in their social protection systems until they're faced to having to do it. Um, I think another legacy is that the COVID-19 crisis highlighted the issues of fairness and current uh, of fairness of current wage structures and made it much more real to many people that the people who were looking after them and on whom they were reliant were really amongst the lowest paid in the country. Um, and while this hasn't necessarily uh, translated yet into any revaluation of these workers, at least it's highlighted the importance of these workers um, in the public domain. Um, I think it's also, we've had an expansion of social protection to cover to female dominated industries and jobs such that I wouldn't expect a repeat of a um, short time work scheme mainly focused on manufacturing and ignoring other sectors, at least not in countries, um, in social democratic countries or where there's um, you know, a more positive attitude towards trying to help women and um, protect jobs. And there's potential for rapid and radical change with respect to making post social protection more inclusive. I think I've already covered that in fact. Um, so in our conclusions, we also wanted to look at what, how you could build on the positive aspects of COVID-19, the experience of short time working and teleworking. Um, and we suggested that we, could, we should use it to promote shorter full time hours um, and shorter weeks and more flexible employment. Um, I think um, I've always been very much of the view that it's very difficult to do anything about women's working hours unless you do something about overall working hours. If you um, have a situation as I described in my own country where people in high level jobs are expected to work very long hours, um, they're, they're not necessarily regulated, um, they're expected to do whatever's necessary, 
uh, then it becomes almost impossible to negotiate a part-time job within those kinds of jobs, because what is a part-time job? Is working 40 hours part-time if the regular hours, are, if the regular workers are working 60 hours. Um, nobody thinks 40 hours is a part-time job, but obviously you can't um, sort of say somebody can work 20 hours and be paid half pay if people uh, in full-time hours are working 60 hours. So I think this whole um, experience of this COVID uh, means that we need to re seriously rethink our length of working hours and to move away from these very long hours and to move towards a greater sharing of work uh, at the household level, both unpaid work of caring, but also sharing um, full um, work in the wage economy. This will be in line with obviously a lot of the concerns about the potential loss of jobs uh, with the next wave of technological change. Um, and I think um, COVID with facilitating um, more sharing at the household level should have been used as a basis for a more innovative way forward, which involved shorter working hours. Um, so that, the, that would promote the sharing of work available and prevent mass unemployment, promote the sharing of care between genders and promote women's economic independence through the creating the conditions that moves out of casual and part-time employment and to into standard employment, but with shorter, more, more family-friendly hours for all. Now, I wrote this um, last June, July. Those opportunities have been wasted and I don't see much sign of them happening, but I think it's worth reiterating that this is a major missed opportunity. And we also ought to build on the experiments under COVID to ensure more universal social protection to protect all workers against job and income loss due to economic shocks, and to protect all workers against job or income loss due to the expected or unexpected need to care with incentives for fathers to care.